Now we're going to look at some arteries. On the right, you're going to see an artery that is obviously thoroughly diseased. And you're probably saying <clears throat> to yourself, when that small remaining opening closes off, there'll be a heart attack. Well, actually, interestingly enough, <clears throat> only about 10% of heart attacks will occur from something which is this disease. Yes, indeed, it may cause chest pain and shortness of breath. But what happens is usually something like this has taken so long to, bec to become this disease that as it is narrowing and narrowing and narrowing, the downstream heart muscle from this blockage has recognized that it has not been getting its due supply and the body does the best it can to make its own bypass. And characteristically, when you do an angiogram of this, you will often see these tiny little collaterals coursing around this blockage, which are enough to protect the downstream heart muscle from having a heart attack, even when that small opening closes because of this backup supply. It, obviously the backup supply never equals what, what it would be normally. But I mentioned that so that you understand, as we see later, we're gonna learn about how 90% of heart attacks are caused. Now, while we're here though, let's look at the left. And that's the normal artery. And I want all of you, even those in the back of the room, to know that that tiny little dark line lining the inside of the artery is called the endothelium. We're gonna have a lot more to say about that. Now, the first thing that happens when you are eating that milkshake, that cheeseburger, that pizza, those cellular elements in your bloodstream begin to get sticky. Your endothelium becomes sticky. Your platelets, your clotting factors get sticky. Your uh, LDL cholesterol gets sticky. And now this happens to be a slide from Peter Libby from Harvard that I'm borrowing. And even though I went to Yale, you'll know that we often uh, share information that Harvard has to give us. Now, to make sense of this, the blue area is where the blood is flowing. At the bottom of the blue area is the beginning of the artery wall. And you can see that single layer of cells lining the inner layer are the endothelial cells. Now, to make sense out of this, let's together once again, let's go to the left upper corner and you will see there these orange molecules of your LDL cholesterol, which has been... Uh, oxidized by the free radicals that come from this food that we've been eating. And those LDL particles in the upper left <clears throat> eventually bump up, against, bump up against the sticky endothelium and find a crack, a fissure, an opening where they can slip through. And now we have the oxidized LDL particle in the subendothelial space. And at this point, Peter Libby no longer paints the LDL orange. It now he paints it yellow because he wants you to know that it is a small, hard, dense, oxidized LDL particle, which the subendothelial space does not like and calls upon our SWAT team, which here Peter Libby of Harvard has painted blue in honor of Yale. And we, and we like that. Now, once this uh, SWAT team is also in the subendothelial space. It begins its job of gobbling up, gobbling up, gobbling up all these small, hard, dense LDL particles as it transverses from left to right in this slide. Now, when we get all the way over to the right, where the SWAT team is, is now absolutely chocked full of all these small, hard, dense LDL particles, we do in medicine what we do so often, we change the name and it now becomes a foam cell. And the foam cell truly is the Darth Vader of this sequence of events. Why? Because the foam cell elaborates these nasty metalloproteinases like stromelosin 
a collagen, a collagenase, myeloperoxidase, what do they do? The, the metalloproteinases progressively will thin out the cap over the plaque. Let's direct our attention to the figure on the left here. And you will see, if you look carefully at the cap over the plaque, in the upper portion of the plaque, there is a tear. And now what happens is, is there is the extravasation of, or the oozing out of, if you will, of plaque content into the flowing blood. That tends to activate our clotting factors uh, platelets. And if we go now to the middle figure B, you can see a clot beginning to form uh, where there was that tear in the cap over the plaque. And that clot is in of itself self-propagating. And so in a matter of minutes, now we go all the way from just that little tear in the cap over the plaque. Now we're in the figure on the far right, figure C, and there is so much clot, the entire artery is blocked. And all that downstream heart muscle below there is deprived of oxygen and nutrients. And this is now 90% of your heart attacks. Now, if I do my job correctly today, hopefully all of you and all, all of your friends and relatives will be able to make themselves heart attack proof. How are we gonna do that? Well, we're not gonna do that with a pill. We're not gonna do that with a stent. We're not gonna do that with a bypass. We're gonna do it by changing your biochemistry. How are we gonna change your biochemistry? We're gonna do that by <clears throat> changing the food that you eat, your diet. You're gonna be plant-based. And when you're plant-based and you change your biochemistry, that entire cascade of events that I've just shared with you is not gonna happen. You're not gonna oxidize your LDL cholesterol. It is not going to migrate into the subendothelial space. There will be no call for the, for the SWAT team or the foam cell. And with no foam cell and no metalloproteinases, there will be no thinning of the cap over your plaque. As a matter of fact, you will strengthen the cap over your plaque. And when you strengthen the cap over your plaque, it cannot rupture. If you cannot rupture the plaque, the cap over your plaque, you now have made yourself heart attack proof. We think that takes at least about three weeks. Now, <clears throat> You don't have to pay attention to the uh, x-ray on this slide, but let's sort of focus on how the artist has drawn the opening to this artery. Half of it is filled with a uh, blockage or plaque, and the other half is still open, and the other half, which is open, if you look at the innermost portion of it, you will see the uh, endothelial cells. Now, historically, it's rather interesting that we used to think up and actually until about 1980, we used to think of the endothelial cells as those cute, cute little red bricks that were lining our pipes. However, that all changed in 1980 when Dr. Fershgott, working in his laboratory in Brooklyn, was taking the largest blood vessel in the rodent, the aorta. And he would take this aorta and he would make sort of an elliptical spiral staircase cut on the aorta. And then he would immerse it in saline and it would constrict. But one day he decided there will be no cut, no injury to the endothelial cells. He immersed the aorta with no cut and it dilated. He did it with another one the same way, it dilated. And now suddenly the race was on globally. What was the EDRF that Dr. Fershgott had discovered? Endothelial derived relaxation factor. Thank heavens. That, to, uh, <laughs> that term was with us only eight years. For at the end of eight years, Dr. Fershgott, Dr. Louis Narrow, and Dr. Murad discovered that the EDRF was a gas, a gas called nitric oxide. And because of that discovery, 
Ten years later, in 1998, those three men received the Nobel Prize. Now, what is it about nitric oxide that makes it worthy of a Nobel Prize? Well, let's look at its functions. One, nitric oxide will keep all the cellular elements within your bloodstream flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro. It keeps things from getting sticky. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest blood vessel dilator in the body. When you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, the arteries to your legs, they widen, they dilate. That's nitric oxide. Number three, number three, nitric oxide will protect the wall of the artery from becoming thickened, stiff, or inflamed, protect us from getting high blood pressure, hypertension. Number four is the absolute key. A safe and normal amount of nitric oxide will protect us all from ever developing any blockages or plaques. So literally, everybody on the planet Earth, whether they're from London, Berlin, Chicago, New York, or Long Island, if they have, cardiovascular disease, it is because by now in the previous decades, they have so sufficiently trashed, injured, compromised, and turned their endothelial system into an absolute train wreck that they no longer have enough nitric oxide to protect themselves from making blockages and plaque. However, the good news is this. This is not a malignancy. It is a completely benign foodborne illness. And if once you you can get patients to understand that never, never, never again are they to pass through their lips and a single morsel of food that is going to further injure an already, endo, an already train wrecked endothelium because then the recovering endothelium can make enough nitric oxide to halt any disease progression and we will often see significant elements of disease reversal. Now, I can just know that having done this presentation a number of times, about now the audience is saying to itself, gosh, I kind of wonder, what are, I wonder what my nitric oxide is. Well, we don't have a good test yet available in the office for this, but I will share with you how it's done from a research standpoint. If you take an ultrasound probe and place it over your brachial artery at the elbow, you will get a readout of the diameter of that brachial artery. And then you will put a blood pressure cuff around your upper arm and inflate it above systolic blood pressure so that for five minutes, you have absolutely zero blood flow to your forearm and hand, and I've done that, and it's not exactly <laughs> habit forming. But then after five minutes, you release the blood pressure cuff and immediately remeasure <clears throat> the new diameter, <clears throat> the new diameter of the brachial artery. And in the normal individual, it'll be 30% greater. Now, the next great thing that happened was Dr. Robert Vogel, chairman of, uh, chairman of medicine at the University of Maryland, took a group of healthy young uh, subjects to a certain fast food restaurant that is characterized by arches, which are golden. Half of the group ate the cornflakes. The other half had the hash browns and sausage. For the group that ate the cornflakes, when they measured their uh, nitric oxide level uh, afterwards, it was normal. The group that ate the hash browns and sausage, 120 minutes later, with the brachial artery tourniquet test, they could not dilate the artery. That single meal of hash browns and, and sausage had so trashed, so injured, so compromised, their endothelial cells, they were unable to make enough nitric oxide to dilate the artery. However, being young, <clears throat> later, as they followed them into the late afternoon, early evening, they kind of began to recover. However, you and I know that the next morning for breakfast is probably going to be scrambled eggs and bacon. 
Lunchtime, it'll be white bread with mayonnaise and cold cuts. For supper time, a baked potato with sour cream, lamb chops, vegetable soaked in butter, ranch dressing on the salad, and ice cream for dessert. <clears throat> Here in the good old USA, starting as our childhood, all day long, we begin injuring and injuring and injuring our endothelial cells. So it's no great surprise that as we approach midlife, we see this tsunami of cardiovascular disease. <laughs>